morning. I'm Karen Diaz, Dean of Libraries. Um, and I am happy to welcome you to our sixth annual Art in the Libraries major exhibit opening. Um, this has become sort of a, a great annual event that I've really grown to um, look forward to, starting with our first exhibit, which was about water, um, to our most recent exhibit um, last year, which was on indigenous Appalachia. I continue to be impressed with the magic that our exhibit curator, Sally Brown, uh, weaves with each of these uh, complex exhibits that intersect such interesting expertise, talent, and perspective to create what are truly uh, opportunities for investigation and exploration, both of which, of course, are very important to the goals of any library. Sally's insight as an artist each year brings forth a visual representation of what our library and I dare say our campus do in much more tangible and ethereal ways each and every day. This year for the first time, we've turned the light on ourselves um, with this exhibit. But of course, the library isn't just the building or just the employees. The libraries are also the people who, who inhabit these spaces, who build relationships with us and create their own experiences in these places. As our campus has been undergoing difficult transformation, I want to um, note the timeliness of this exhibit, and I want to appreciate um, the quote that our guest of honor, Emily Dravinsky, provided for us for our press release. And in that quote, she says, hacking the library invites us to think about our institutions as places of engagement and transformation. As buildings and collections, they may look fixed in place, but as sites of research and study, exploration and imagination, libraries are always in motion, from the classification structures that group like with like, to the copy machines that are always in need of repair. Libraries are always subject to change. This library, of course, is constantly changing, and, um, and now we're, we're looking at potentially some, some bigger changes. Um, I do want to note that budget changes are always with us, and they constantly serve as both a support and a constraint for the work that we do. As a public good, we are dependent on our public to support us, and so working to build the trust and regard of our public is a constant mission of ours. I'm confident in our ability to adapt as we always have and to face what lies ahead for us. I will say that the serendipity of looking at libraries through artists' eyes this year is proving to be a personal gift for me, and I hope it will be for you as well. So welcome. Um, we are really pleased that you are here, and now I would like to turn things over to our curator, Sally. Sally Brown. Inviting other librarians to respond to the work might provide the most apt and intimate context to our work 
and for the intent of the exhibit. So quickly, because we had to integrate the work for the designer, we posted a national call for responses from librarians to the artwork with a simple Google form and received feedback nationwide from academic, public, and even school librarians, including Emily Dr Drabinsky. That was quite a thrill, and now she's here. So including responses was a new way of presenting work for us, and I think offers a personal and provocative experience for everyone that enters these spaces beyond when it travels. The designers, Little Fish Design, did a fabulous job integrating the content and capturing the happy vibe. The exhibit will also be available online very soon, thanks to Travis Williamson. I also want to thank librarians Beth Torian and Catherine Fonseca for their support of the project in many ways. Paula Martelli for her help fundraising. Of course, our sponsors, the WVU Humanities Center, the WVU Office of the Provost, Marshall University Library, Virginia Tech Library, and Mormontown Printing and Binding. I also want to thank Tracy Dinges and the 2023 ESL Fulbright Pre-Academic Program students from around the world for creating the awesome posters in the Central Stairway. And thanks to Deanna and Joseph for putting this whole event together. Lastly, I'm also excited that it's the first time we collaborated with the Morgantown Public Library System. We have a banner that features a few of the artworks from the exhibition with the participatory, participatory element and linked to the online exhibit at the downtown Morgantown Public Library that will also travel. Thank you, Sarah Palfrey, for all of your contributions to make this project come to fruition. With that, I'd like to introduce Sarah. Sarah Palfrey has been the director of the Morgantown Public Library System since 2017 a municipal library that serves all of Mondale County at six locations. Her 25 years in libraries have included positions in academic, private, public, and shipboard libraries. She holds a BA in history and has a master's in library and information science. Sarah has been active in the West Virginia Library Association, holding leadership positions on the executive board, legislative committee, and the public libraries division since 2003. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Um, and I also want to say thank you 
to the maintenance staff who produced this clean and well-lit space for us. The people who arranged the furniture, I understand this is off in the reading room, so to have it set up like this must have taken a significant amount of labor. The people responsible for placing the catering order, who placed the catering order? Yeah. 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 So where I work, placing the catering order is the least fun that a person could have at a university, right? And so I always think of um, think of that work as, as really quite, it's always an oddly difficult challenge at the City University of New York, and one that I have avoided. So thank you, Thea, for placing the catering order. <laughs> and then to the people who prepared the catering, delivered these refreshments to us. And that list could go on and on, thanking all of the people made it possible for us to be here in this room today together. Uh, and the work that people do to make the library what it is, is something that I think a lot about and what I'm going to talk about a little bit here today. So the main argument of my career, I think, is that libraries are institutions that structure things. We take, at the very base, what do we do? We take big piles of books and we put them in order. So as soon as you have a collection of more than 30 books, um, and you're not me, as, as any other librarian, just put your books sort of really, really on the shelf, because you that's your day job. Yeah, so that's me. <laughs> My partner who's in a store and has all of her books sort of arranged by category. But uh, what do we do? We take books, a big pile of them, we put them on a shelf, uh, and we make sense and meaning out of them. Many of the structures that we use in the library are invisible to the people who walk into them. They walk into our buildings and imagine that everything here is automatic. So I want to talk about those structures a little bit because I think if we understand the library as a kind of structuring machine, which is how I talked about it before, uh, we can see the way that the library is actually the site of all forms of change. That we can learn best how to make the world we want by learning how to operate within the institution of the library. So I'll give you three examples of structures in the library that I think are important. First, there's the structure of the library as a building. The heat, light, bathrooms. As I said when we met earlier today to talk about uh, um, the sort of journal article that I had written, I, I was struck by how easily I was able to walk into this building, go to the bathroom, I could find it, get a drink of water, and then meet with people. And all of that is possible because of this physical structure that exists. I think about this a lot right now, too, because libraries are under such an intense attack by the right. Um, can I say that by the right? Am I in an audience that can say that? <laughs> Organized pro-censorship forces that have attacked libraries as books, as the books in our collections, but also the existence of our buildings in the first place. I've traveled all over the country looking at libraries and talking to librarians, and so many of them have talked about the part where it begins with a challenge to a book and ends with a defunding of the institution altogether and a closing of that building. So I think it's very, very important that we think about the library space as a structure that makes certain kinds of public life possible. Uh, crucially, we make interior public space possible, right? There is no other institution in our cities, towns, rural communities, big, big cities, where a person could go in, like I did today, walk in as a total stranger, sit down, take a little rest, uh, take advantage of some air conditioning, and use the bathroom. So those buildings are structural things that are crucial to the existence and persistence of a kind of public life. And I guess at a university library like this, or a university like this, there are all kinds of other spaces but no other space exists that invites, explicitly invites everyone in. Um, I took a tour with Jesse at the new um, business building, what's it called? Reynolds Hall. What, what? Reynolds. Reynolds Hall. Great space, but it didn't have a sense that it was there for me to sit and be quiet and study or meet as a group. And I, I'm, I'm against the stairs thing. I <laughs> said, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what a misuse of space. Okay. Um, <laughs> So that's one structure that I think is really important, and making those spaces bigger and making them uh, have more of the resources and, and opportunities that we want, I think is really crucially important. The second structure that I think is crucial, and you walk into a library, you can tell you're inside of a building, but I think like 
librarians and library workers were the only ones who understand that the way these books are organized is due to the uh, structure of itself, the structure of classification and cataloging that makes it possible for us to find books on a shelf rather than just having to dig through a big, big pile. Um, we also know that those structures organize materials according to uh, particular modes of thought and particular ways of being. And I've written about this quite a bit from the pers my perspective as a, 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 a queer person in the world, right, who looks for books about my sexual identity and uh, finds them housed in the HQ section, uh, which is where we have social problems, and books about being a lesbian aligned with books about uh, other kinds of deviant sexualities that are deemed um, impermissible. Uh, and that's something that uh, those of us who occupy other categories of social difference understand really all too well. Uh, when I, um, I'm cognizant that many of you heard this story before earlier, but I'm going to tell you. Uh, when I first started working at Sarah Lawrence College as a librarian, which is where I met Jesse here in the audience, uh, we had just finished reclassifying the collection from Dewey to the Library of Congress. And that entailed a shift of the entire collection. Has anyone here done a shift before? Does anyone here want to do a shift again? <laughs> no. Uh, and it was horrible because you have to pick up every book and dust it and move it somewhere. And we have two copies of the autobiography of Christine Jorgensen, which is the first autobiography of a trans woman published in the West. And uh, the first book was shelved in the basement of the Sarah Lawrence Library in the RCs, with alongside other books that were classified as uh, books about problems of the mind, mental illnesses, right, psychological problems. We had a reissue of the memoir with a contextualizing, historicizing essay by a queer historian, and that was located up on the third floor of the building of the library in the HQ section, where it was sat next on the shelf to books about other kinds of deviant, deviant sexualities, but they were very far away from each other. And in the Sarah Lawrence College Library, there was an elevator, but it was slow, and mostly had to walk up this like spiral, you remember this, like stone spiral stairs, and it was a lot of walking to find these two books. And depending on which one you chose, it contextualized that book with the other stories around it, shaping the way that we think about the material that we're reading. Is this a book about um, gender as a, as a psychological problem that must be fixed by uh, psychological professionals, or is it a social fact of way of being with one another. And so from that sort of like material experience, I was, came to understand the library classification cataloging scheme as an ideological project that tells certain kinds of stories about certain ways of being. And if you look at the Library of Congress subject or classification, which you, you should do sometime, <laughs> and, um, you'll see that sexuality is under this category of uh, women and the family which I always find striking, right? Because there are women and the family, and there are no men in the family. It is the responsibility of the woman. So if you read that classification, you can really see what the library tells, what stories the library tells about itself. So that's another structure that, uh, even it is an intellectual infrastructure that those of us who work in the library understand, but our users may not necessarily um, connect with. So those are two structures. The third structure, I would say, is, so I talked a little bit about the building as just a general thing, but then there's also the way that we organize space within the library to highlight what we care about. So as I was walking through this library, I saw that we care here about making sure people have access to space that's quiet. The sensory room seems very cool. We know that we have spaces for group study, silent study, all kinds of study like that, lots of places to plug things in, um, space and the ways that we arrange it tell us what we care about and what kinds of behaviors we expect here. So thinking about the Reynolds Hall, where one of the things that that space is communicating to me is that I need to care a lot about stock prices, <laughs> right? The building is telling me that that is the thing that matters, as opposed to a building like this one, 
which this room is telling me that the history of Appalachia matters and is important for me to know something about. So these are all structures, and they're all structures that can be changed, and I think that's the essential piece for me. That those of us who work in libraries know this, right? How many of us have been on a space planning committee that said, uh, as I assume it happened here, that the men's and women's bathrooms were not sufficient, that this library needed also to have all gender bathrooms available for people. Uh, I'm assuming that was a decision that had to be made by people who recognize that there are people in our community who need access to an all gender bathroom. And there had to be work and decisions and conversations and probably conflict about getting those bathrooms in place. But they can be changed. And I know that because I used one earlier today. Those bathrooms signal to the people in this community that all kinds of bodies matter and all kinds of bodies are welcome here. We also know that cataloging and classification systems can change. Uh, I'm part of, you know, sort of adjacent to a critical cataloging movement that spends lots and lots of time updating language so that it doesn't uh, continue to uh, reproduce sort of ideological perspectives that we want out of our library. The subject having illegal, illegal aliens being a really good example of that. And the immense amount of political work and organizing that went into changing that terminology so that it was not, so that every time someone went to search for that kind of information, they weren't encountering uh, the sort of racist understanding of um, migrants in this, in, this, in this country, right? Um, so that we can always change the system. Although I say that, and how many of us would want to change the classification system, right? So then that means a shift, which I just said we didn't want to do. So all of these are material changes, and they're limited by um, sort of material conditions under which we work. We can always reconfigure spaces and make them different. We didn't always have group study rooms. We didn't always have whiteboards in our spaces. This room, Karen was telling me, just got the furniture on wheels pretty recently. Right? We can make that decision that we want the room to be configurable so that it can be used by sort of everyone. Um, and that's what we do as librarians. We have these structures and we are constantly engaged in the project of changing them. Always, right? Like when I my first job at Sarah Lawrence College, I was in charge of leading the CD Knox, right? Like that is a thing that we used to do and the job has changed and I don't need those anymore, um, but I've needed lots of so what I think this exhibit does really well is highlight the ways that libraries and all structures are subject to change. They're subject to change when we engage them, when we see them, and want to see them be different. I think we live in a time, um, and I'm speaking very like broadly, we live in a time, but I do think we live in a time where what we need to see and understand is that it, there is lots of evidence in the world that things can be different from the way that they are. Lots of it. And I don't know about you, but I spend a significant amount of time trying to battle against the part of me that says it's over, it's hopeless, the world as we live in it right now is as good as it's ever going to get. But we know, those of us who work in the library, that things can be different because we work at that every day as part of our job. That is our task in the world. And that we can be a part of making things different and that it begins with us. And it begins with coming into contact with structures and understanding them as structures and then finding the point in the structure that you can push make it sort of unwind and switch and change. And that's what the art in this exhibit does so well and why I find it quite inspiring and why I'm so glad to be able to be here to celebrate this exhibit with you. Because it shows us that it's not just those of us who work in the library thinking, oh, maybe we need to add a smart board here, or whatever, that those ordinary decisions we make every day. Um, do we want to turn on the scanning function on the copy machine? I worked in a library for a long time where that was a conflict that we had. <laughs> but it's the kind of conflict that we encounter every day, and we resolve every day, and we solve those problems every day, and we solve them together. Um, and I think that kind of uh, message that things can be different, that we can make it so, that we work inside of systems and structures, that we have power to change and have agency in, those are lessons I think we need more. Uh, today than maybe ever before if we want to work together to make the world we want, and I think that is what we want to do. So in closing, a uh, salute to the artists who have made this show so uh, powerful. It was such an honor and a pleasure to be able to be an early uh, viewer of them and to be able to share my feedback.
feedback and comments on the art. And I'm really excited to be here to celebrate with all of you. So thank you.
keep it awesome. <laughs> the concept. Anyway, so like everything we do matters, and I'm, I'm happier with a life that matters. And that it's good. Um, I think art in the library is crucial because it brings people into the space, and it makes the space of the library uh, about more than just the books, right? And it indicates kind of engagement with the space that I think is really crucial. So in, I think, um, I think the library has, and we talked about this a little earlier, about how the library is, can, can in some ways become just a space, like it's just a study hall, but it is a space. And it is a study hall. And those are crucial services. And I am somebody who spent all of my K-12 education in the library when I was in class. You know, I can't be the only person to lunch in the library. <laughs> and just being able to sit in the library and, and have that experience of, this, of, of myself in a space that was made for thought was really crucial. Um, so I think art is important, like this image, right? This painting is important, but I think what's exciting about the work that you're doing here is that the art changes and then invites engagement. And so engagement with the space and engagement with the structures and engagement with the idea that the library could look different and it could be different. And so I think it, 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 it's political in that way, um, but also uh, having more people engage with the space is, is, I think, really crucial to not just our survival, which I do think we're in moments where the existential nature of libraries is in question, um, but also just for the people who come in every day and want to see something. That's what I think. But I'm not a <laughs> This is a, it's a, a small question, but a big question, mm -hmm. slightly tangential. But, um, so a lot of people are talking about the culture on campuses and the culture of students and personal rights and everything from the internet to COVID and how people are learning differently. So as a, like a litmus test, the library has everybody. So, I don't know if you're engaging on this level with students, but how do you think people are, students are learning or asking questions differently than they were before? Because the culture is, is changing. When you say before, before, what are you thinking? Oh, we could do COVID, we could do the internet, we could do, we could go to anyone, but just. I saw a talk last week by Naomi Klein. And I am a big booster of her new book called Doppelganger. Uh, and she writes about the problem of being mistaken for Naomi Wolf. And she goes sort of down in the rabbit hole of trying to understand what happened to Na Naomi Wolf, who I remember from her book, The Beauty Myth, which I was assigned in college. She brings a feminist text, and I read it dutifully and wrote probably a paper about it. Um, but she has now become someone who uh, traffics in this information and disinformation. And even that is like a misnomer. She's in a whole other planet of information, right? Where the terms of, in, of the world are just completely, you know, Klein calls it the mirror world. So she's like operating in the mirror world. And I think, so that's some of our students are in the mirror world, claiming a kind of personal right to be wrong, you know, or to, to occupy another planet where the rules of a of a collective society where we all agree on some basic terms where we're going to like help each other and not be disruptive, like where that's banished. So I think um, I don't have a lot of contact with students like that. I don't know how much they come into the library, but I know that they are students in classrooms um, from classroom teachers that I know. Um, I don't know that students, like with the exception of that kind of extreme example, I don't know that students are that different than they were before. And I, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I think the basic question of who am I in the world? And how, how am I going to figure out how to be here? And who are my people? And where can I find myself? Which were the questions that I asked as a college student. I think most students ask as college students. And they also ask, like, do you have any books about the Civil War, right? Or something broad, like, grand, you know, they're still doing that, you know, but, but I think those those sort of questions about that people bring to the library if we think expansively about who students are and what they need from us. I don't I don't know that that has, has changed. You know, maybe they ask the question online or on the phone. But I don't know, that's just my 
I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. What do you think? Do you think that's di they're different? Then they are not teaching a medical library. Yeah. And I find that they are, um, but I find that the core is who am I, where do I go, where do I belong, and the vocabulary changes. The, the confusion I feel is greater. And sort of the alienation is greater than I remember it. Yeah, and you know, I wonder if that has something to do with, with the way information circulates now. Right in the um, just in the, logically the eternal scroll. You know, I'm a 15 year old, and his world is this big, <laughs> right? It's this size and shape. And I think you know, when I was growing up, I had to read a book, and the, the sort of parameters of the information I was encountering really were a lot more limited. You know, like trying to teach a student about a journal article and what it is. You know. Like just the simple Google box. Like I remember as a kid getting lost in libraries mm -hmm. and ended up doing comparative literature and different languages and literatures because I couldn't stop. I kept finding more and more things. And all those rabbit holes, and now people will come to class and they just Google one thing. They don't get lost in the terse in, in the other layers. They'll find an answer that comes to them. They don't have to figure it out in the same way. Mm -hmm. And I think that changes how people um, work with curiosity. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're used to putting a word in and getting an answer back. That whole process. Yeah. And we're used to putting a word in and getting very, very rapidly information that's completely incorrect. I had cancer a few years ago, and I like did what every cancer patient does. I Google cancer, am I going to die? And like, <laughs> Oh, it comes, you know, it's like it was not even at the end of that first page of results when we were telling you to take turn. Like it was not even, you know. So I do think there's a problem with the way that this information works online and how rapidly you encounter it and how few bumpers there are. You know, there's just you're out in a morass of, of poor information. Like I just, I, like it was, I had a flight, I had a flight delay last week at the board. This is the boring story that I tell I had a flight delay at the board yet, and I was able to, so I live in New York City, and I was able to, Rebook and then the rebooked flight got canceled. But anyway, I was able to rebook a flight on a um, 6 a.m. flight. So I was like, instead of going all the way to South Brooklyn, let me just get a hotel right there by the airport. So I got a hotel right there by the airport. And then when I arrived, there was one person working there, and it was his first night, and all of us had had our flights canceled, and he was like, up oh, and he just couldn't. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to like leave and get a refund on the room. And so I went home and Got up in the next morning and I, call, I, I tried to call the, the hotel and I googled the name of the hotel and called the first number that came up and it was a site that does third party brokering for the hotel. But I was deep into the conversation before I understood that I had entered a kind of mirror world that I'd fallen down this mirror and I am a professional. <laughs> <laughs> I google things for my job and I make good decisions about information and so that I think like you're, it's so easy to fall off, which is why it's even more important than, it's more important than ever to have these kinds of in-person gatherings, to make sure that we're meeting each other in the classroom, that we're having real conversations with real people about real issues and real things. So, like, pulling people out of that, I think, has to be part of the task now, just like getting them back into the, into the world. And COVID didn't help at all. You know, my kid was spending a year and a half in a world this size and getting him out of that. We've started playing some card games. That's, I will let you know if that works <laughs> next time I'm here in Morgan Town. But yeah, I think these, are, these are big problems. Thank you so much for inviting me, and um, I look forward to sharing food with you all.